In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions asked by listeners like you. And the way we open the episode is by talking about current events. We bring up scientific studies. We talk about our lives. Sometimes we mention our sponsors. So I'm going to give you the full breakdown of today's Mind Pump podcast episode. We started by talking about the guy who got revenge on his child, on the kid who bullied him when he was a kid. Yeah. Uh, boy. Best Perfect. way to do it right there. Best revenge i ever heard of in my life. Then we talked about bullies, uh, bullies that we dealt with when we were kids and how sometimes we acted like bullies I too. I may have been one. Maybe. For a minute. Uh, we talked about how Facebook is going to be adjusting salaries based on where you live. That's interesting. Uh, Adam brought up how IGTV uh, on Instagram is going to start advertising on there now. So now as an influencer, you can actually make some revenue off your IGTV. Platform wars. I talked about how PETA is buying shares uh, at slaughterhouses like Tyson, um, just so that they have uh, some influence, which I think is actually a smart move. Hey, what do you know? know? Smart, Peter. Yeah. Now, we did talk about nutrition and nutrients, and some of the most nutrient-dense foods you'll find on the planet are organ meats. These are organ meats from animals, of course. Now, we work with a company called Paleo Valley. Now, you may know them for their incredible grass-fed and grass-finished beef sticks. We love them. But they make other products as well, including an organ complex, which has liver, heart, and kidney. So these are capsules with dried organ meats inside of them. You take them daily like a supplement, and you get all those amazing nutrients. Now, because you listen to Mind Pump, you get a huge discount. Here is your hookup. Go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O valley.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump, and it'll get 15% off your first order of any of their products. Then we talked about Walt Disney World planning to open in July in Florida. Uh, Justin brought up how, I guess, Native Americans don't have the gene that makes you go bald. That's yeah. kind of cool. And also, one announcement. We are having a live priming webinar uh, this Saturday um, at, at 10 a.m. Pacific. So you can go on there, watch Justin teach you how to self-assess your body and teaches you priming movements. And then at the end of it, Adam, Justin, and myself will be on there live on video answering any of your questions. You can go sign up at Maps Prime Webinar. Come hang out with us. Dot com. Um, and then we got into the questions. The first question, this person wants to know about the ab wheel. Is it a gimmick? Does it work really well? We talk all about it in that part of the episode. The next question, this person wants to know, how do you know if you're getting results because of what you're doing or in spite of what you're doing? Um, the third question, hmm. this person wants to know all about intuitive eating. So intuitive eating is eating in a way that is natural, but also promotes good health, a relatively lean and strong body. So we talk all about intuitive eating there. And then the final question, this person wants to know what our advice is for aspiring trainers uh, around what's going on right now with big box gyms. Do we still think that it's a good place to start if you're a personal trainer or now that things are so different, what should trainers do or aspiring trainers do. Um, also, uh, there's only two days left, 48 hours for the 50% off MAPS Starter sale. So MAPS Starter is a workout program. It's great for the house. All you need is a physio ball, two dumbbells, and you can train your whole body. It's awesome for people who want to reap the benefits of resistance training and who also are a bit inexperienced. So it's great for beginners. It's also good for advanced people to relearn perfect form, stability, and technique. And trainers, trainers will will benefit tremendously from this program because it helps you train a lot of your clients virtually. Uh, a lot of your clients may be working out at home, may be limited with their equipment. Map Starter could teach you some really good routines that you can take your clients through. Again, this program is half off. Just go to mapsstarter.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.com and use the code STARTER50. That's S T A R T E R five zero, no space for the discount. Oh, and by the way, if you go to mindpumpmedia.com, check out our apparel. If you're listening to this episode when it drops, there's a few hours left for our huge apparel sale. Uh, we're getting rid of everything. Some stuff is as low as five bucks. Mm. Go check it out.
Did you guys see that video of the ki- the guy uh, on the radio station who slept with his bu- with the bully's mom? <laughs> what? Yeah, dude, you got to... Okay. No, yeah. no, no, no. Tell me. I didn't know the this. whole story, dude. So, this is hilarious. You know how radio stations, they do this thing where they're like, you know, oh, if you have a misconnection or whatever, we'll call the person and set you up or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. So this woman calls in and she calls in and talks about how she went on a, on a couple dates with a, a man 20 years younger than her. Yeah. And they had a great date. And they Who had, just rocked her world in the bedroom. Lots of sex or yeah. whatever. She's sharing all this. And, yeah. yeah. And so she's like, but he, he he's not calling me back. He's not messaging me back. And so the guys on the radio station are like, we'll call him. We'll find out what's going on. Oh, wow. So they call the dude and then they tell him, hey, we got so-and-so on the line. You know, she she said she had a great time. How come we're not calling her back? And he's like, oh, man. He goes, this is embarrassing. Yeah. I got to be honest. He's like, all right, whatever. I don't care. I'll just be honest. He goes, I... I saw the last name on a dating site and I thought, huh, I wonder if she's related to the kid that used to bully the hell out of me in school. Yeah. Looked it up. Sure enough, it was the mom of the bully. And so he's like, to get back at him, I had <laughs> yeah. 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 I had yeah. sex with yeah. his mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he says this on radio, dude. Best oh. story ever. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's true? Yeah, so he, ba- true. he banged his bully's mom. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate. Right? Adam loves that. I do. I do. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. How do you like? You can't bang in your bully's mom. What, yeah, no, what, okay, you did, what, how, what happened? What did she say? Did she no, say something afterwards? Yeah, no. That was just, it was just after. They like, just kind of oh, cut it off yeah. after that. Oh but, my the clip, god, but, that was epic. But think oh, about that. So great. Like, how could you? You can never recover from that. You know what I'm <laughs> that is the ultimate get yeah. back. You know what I'm saying? Like to stoop to his level and just fight him when he get older. Yeah. Eh, whatever. But yeah. to sleep with his mom. And his like, mom was all about it, man. She wanted to keep going. Yeah, yeah. She liked the anger. Yeah. Wow. There was there. Wow. Just, must have been something there. Was he, there ever a kid when you were younger that you know he was such a shit that even to this day, if you think to yourself, I ever run into that kid, I didn't want to. Yeah, do something to him. Is there, like, was there anyone like that? There was one kid like that. Yeah. Really? Yeah, he just had he had a real distinctive nose. Like I would pick him out of the uh, of the crowd easily. Now, what what was his thing? Why was he such a jerk? Uh, cause he, I mean, I think he was just he came from another school and he was trying to kind of like be tough guy, you know, mm-hmm. and was like messing with everybody and like would uh, one time uh, he. He threw a condom at me that was like on the ground, oh. Oh. and I was just oh. that was just like no, you know, <laughs> like I we had to fight, you know, like, you don't do that shit, and uh, but then I I softened up because he tried out for football and he fucking sucked. Did and you, I just did destroyed you, him? You in plowed football. into him. Oh yeah, I would hit him as hard as anybody's ever been hit, uh, you know, on the field. So I felt like I got my. I got my revenge already, mm, mm. but I still hate his face. So I had, there was this kid that used to, he was like a couple years older than me and he was a big kid. So this is when I was like a seventh grade, eighth grade, maybe neighborhood kid. And with his friends, he would say things to me to try and get me to respond. But he's with his friends. He's a lot bigger. And one thing that I does not sit with me, I just can't deal with this is when I feel like I had to back down. So I've had to, I had to back down a couple times from him because he had his buddies and again he was a lot bigger, mm. but in, it was just inside of me like one day you know what one I mean day I will <laughs> get you oh, <laughs> one day I can't wait anyway can't you just picture sound in his backyard pumping iron too right now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bro. Yeah. practicing yeah. kung fu with the, my mom's <laughs> my mom's broomstick you know <laughs> hell yeah yeah watching Karate Kid or didn't we all think or, we knew karate all of us did so even I, though we never had one lesson this, this is a great story so fast forward I'm the general manager at, oh my god that far forward yeah so. So, so seventh grade now, well, I remember I was young. I was only like 19 or 20. Yeah, but still seventh grade all the way up to 19. Yeah. What is that? Five years? Six (laughs) six years? No. Let's see. Junior high, I'm like 12. Okay. Yeah. It's like six years later. Seven years. Yeah. Seven years later. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Anyway, so. That's still a long time. Yeah, it is. You're like adolescence. You're you're, you're at seventh grade and then you're you're a man by the time you're 19. Seven years ain't that long. You've done some life. But seven years ain't that long right now, though. You know what I mean? As you're older. Yeah. I think seven years ago. I'm like, that was yesterday. Yeah. I guess you're right, though. Yeah. So anyway, I'm in the gym and I'm, I'm, you know, managing the gym and front desk calls me up and tells me that this member has a problem with their, with their billing. And I walk up and it's the dude. No. Yes, it's him. Now the, the 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 remedy, and I don't care. I'm gonna say it now. I don't care anymore. I'm gonna tell the truth. The remedy would have been very easy. I would have just had him pay one month back dues. No problem. Here's yeah. your cheap ass membership that you got that gives you all club access. You must have got a great deal back in the day. Uh uh-uh. uh. I looked on the computer. I'm like, wow. 
You have to sign up for a brand new membership. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I could do about that. Do he remember you? Yeah. No, he didn't remember me. Oh, yeah. oh he didn't remember you no, at all. No, no. He was just a shitty fuck. And remember, I was I was like 12. I think he did it to so many kids. Dude. Yeah. Maybe. I he, know. That makes me think. There's probably some kid that really hates me, you know, from when I was a kid. And like you wouldn't that, even recognize fuck him. with them. Yeah. Because I, I fucked with some kids, you know. I was a dick sometimes. Were you? Yeah, I could see that every now and then. Yeah, I, I feel like you would. But I, I like, I like grew out of that, you know. But it was like because I got picked on a lot too. Mm, so. so you learned your lesson. I, I did. Yeah, I, I feel like you would be the meanest of all of us. I, I was a little bit mean, even, but I grew out of that's it. That's not even close. That's for sure. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> Come even, on, man. That's not even a question. That is for sure. <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> be honest here. You know, like <laughs> the most likely bully is for sure. Justin. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think I because my bit. personality comes out strong. But I was a super nice kid, man. I was. I got along with. All, all different walks of life. And I was, I was small. I was in no place to be a bully. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I was a skinny, you know, kid that would have probably got his ass kicked by a lot of people if I was trying to bully people. So And you I, moved you moved a bit, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. I moved around a lot. So yeah, I was in I was in no position to be a bully. I was trying to gain friends all the time. Although I, I had two major like bullies in my life. Many times I think my uh, my whole life, uh, you know, in and out, I was teased. Uh, that that was to me. I felt that was just part of life and normal. Mm -hmm. But I had two like bullies, like people that like, you know, dreading seeing them, you know, in the hallway or running into them on the campus or like that. That would just drove me crazy. The first two were <clears throat> when I was really young. I was uh, let's see here, fourth or fifth grade, and they were eighth graders. I, I went to a K through eighth school. They were eighth graders, and I was like fifth grade. And uh, they would just they would they would pick on everybody, all the younger kids, and you know they cornered me in the bathroom and bullied. And that was like kind of the the climax of of the bullying was they had bullied me all the time, just kind of pushing around, teasing. They co they cornered me in the bathroom one time, and, and they tried to stuff my head in the toilet, and I fought back and got roughed up a little bit, and then eventually, oh, damn, they're trying you, to give you a swirly. Yeah, so Basically, if there's a name for it, Justin. Yeah, yeah there is a name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 he's I, all the the good I, old. That's swirly. what I heard. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wasn't a part of he's it. He's like, obviously, I, their technique was off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's all, two of them couldn't they, get they, yeah, yeah, down. This yeah. is that's pathetic. Yeah, Justin, just take one of. them. Me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. But my, yeah. my stepdad uh caught wind of this. I came home crying, I think, that day at school. And so the next day he he wanted me to point him out, you know. So I pointed him out and he fucking scared the shit out of him. So that was the last time nice. that uh I ever had to deal with those guys. And then the next time I had like a bully was uh in high school. And I you know, I should he wasn't really a bully because he I think a bully normally has to be bigger than you and older than you. This guy was actually a grade below me, but he was a wrestler and he like you He'd roll up with like his ten wrestler buddies all the time and talk shit. Yeah. And, oh, those are the worst. Ones. I hate that. Oh, yeah. and he, Cowards. he drove. On, he drove, and I was a real friendly kid, especially in high school. Got along with everybody, and uh, you know, I was. I loved high school, so I like it. Wasn't like his. And this, this was my one, you know, and 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 antithesis or antagonist, right? Nemesis. This nemesis, right? This yeah. one guy who just. Constantly and a whole year of this where he constantly and then it finally he was probably sweet on you yeah, yeah, yeah I don't know I don't, no I, I think I've shared with it uh, Adam with, was friendly no he did, he did yeah. say that I told you my really sophomore year in high school remember I told you this story I I've, I think I've talked about it on the podcast where um, my my buddy had a uh, one of my buddies had an older brother who was a senior when we were sophomores and one you know saturday night when we had nothing to do but you know we we're playing video games the the upperclassmen came over and they picked us up and said let's go let's get in the suburban we're going to oh, go this is we're going to go paintballing right so it's like midnight and we they the upperclassmen were in the driver's seat and the passenger seat and then all of us underclass sophomores were you know piled in the back of the suburban so you know we're guilty by association here and we were driving around neighborhoods, like you know, shooting people with the paintball gun. Ugh. And one of the houses, <laughs> you know get you arrested these days. <laughs> yeah, 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 wow. Yeah. Yeah, and so this was the '90s, kids. Yeah, back then know. shit was a little different. Yeah, it was way different, right? You definitely probably get shot if you did that. Dude, in San Jose. Hurt too. Yeah. Oh yeah, really and we, we did it to uh, we, you know, one of the one of the kids that uh, one of my friends who was a sophomore was like one of the fastest kids in school. And he was like the running back on the football team, good friend of mine. They would send him out to go run to doorbells, hit the doorbell at like midnight, run back in the car. By the time he got back in the car, they were answering the door, and then they would shoot the people mm -hmm. that answered the door. And one of the houses that we went to 
was like a, a younger girl. She was like a freshman or an eighth grader at the time. And the paintballs hit her. This is I know this story because my parents later on made me go apologize to the family. So, so you're just in the back of the truck. Oh, yeah. I'm just in the back. I'm like, I don't have... Now, what point were you thinking... You ever, was this one of those situations where you're like, uh, fuck. Like, yeah, why am I here? Yeah. It was half that. And then the other half of it, like, you know, I'm not doing it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're, you're they're doing it. I'm just there. And it's my buddy's older brother. So... You know, by no means did I say, let me out. I don't yeah. want to be a part of this. Yeah. I, I definitely wasn't that kid. I was, I was just as guilty. I was there. But anyways, uh, you know, they, they hit, the paintballs hit her and they don't explode. They just, they just blah, 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 like three of them tag her and she falls to the ground crying. Oh, it's midnight. You know, parents come running down. She think they think she's been shot. It was like this. Oh my God. Yeah. And I don't know any of this. I love that night. We just shoot and go. Right. And this happened all night long. But it made the news, like in the newspaper, everything the next day, and like cop, there was rewards out for us and all this. Were you shit. scared at this point? But yeah, I was definitely scared because yeah, they had a bounty on you. Oh guys? yeah, no, I actually have clippings for of like times where I've been in trouble like that, where there's rewards that were put out for me. <laughs> <laughs> you saved them. Yeah, I did. I did. I have them. I still have them. That's not narcissistic <laughs> yeah. at all. Well, uh... Yeah, you show so, your own wanted post. Yeah, you show your kid yeah, your scrapbook. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, Dad, is that when you won right. the wrestling tournament? Yeah. No, no, no. That's <laughs> so when they were looking for me. They couldn't yeah, find me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other time we got in big trouble was uh, the uh, sign napping. That's in fact that's what the the, the article for reward, reward for sign nappers. And we we went and during election time, so it was around this time oh. where everybody puts the signs in yards. Oh yeah. We thought it'd be a funny prank. One of the our cheerleader girlfriends. Uh, we went and like we had three cars and two of them were one was a Bronco and two trucks and we went around the entire town and we collected like every sign we could find which literally took hours of work which is theft yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and we and we pile them in and Legally. then we and we went and we put we stuck them in her her lawn every single all one. of them yeah there was like hundreds <laughs> bro like we even like someone even took kicked down one of those bill big billboard voting signs so oh we kicked down one from off the side of the, the main highway road and then put it in against wow. the, oh it was just crazy yeah. you guys needed video yeah. games so they, they i was just gonna say that yeah. they they you know they say technology is bad because kids don't go outside and they <laughs> well, we, but they're not doing this shit anymore i know you know what i mean yeah, well we were totally. playing video they got something to do. that's exactly what we were doing yeah. when they came and got us we were playing video games and they're like let's go we got a paintball gun. I was like, all right, that sounds cool, you know. Yeah. The game but sucked that, back then, though. That, the, the kid, yeah, they weren't that great. The kid that bullied me was the older brother of that sister. So it's just, and then he knew you were in the car. Well, the reason why he knew was because my parents, okay, they went to the same church. This all got around. I got found out that I wasn't where I was supposed to be. So my parents put together what was going down, and the next day. I had to go to their house and apologize for what happened. Well, that's a good move by right. your parents. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. It was a great lesson for me of, you know, like... <laughs> fucking... But now you're target number one oh, for yeah. brother. So yeah. now then the whole rest of the school year, I've got this guy that just, you know, feels like he needs to protect his sister, right? Of course. And, and, you know, this is hindsight looking back, so I have more empathy and understanding to them. As a high school kid, I'm like, fuck you. I didn't do anything. You know what I'm saying? Mm, I was just in the right. backseat. You're going to single me out and try and punk me all the time, right? So... Yeah, it eventually it led it up in uh, a year later of you know me meeting up at the park and like fifty people there and being recorded. I whooped the shit out of this kid, but I, I definitely didn't want to. You know, mm. it was like something I tried to avoid at all costs. I didn't want to fight him over this, especially since it was yeah. like I had nothing real. I mean, I was there, but I didn't do anything to his. I didn't have any animosity towards his sister. It, it does seem like these those things happen a lot more when we were younger. <laughs> probably even more before that, and it's it's less and less now. At least it gets treated a little bit differently. I know if you, I mean, could you imagine what they would do to a kid? Oh wow, shooting yeah. paintballs in oh, someone's door at midnight. Yeah, they probably send you to jail. Yeah, no, you would definitely. I mean, you would maybe even during that time if you were like in a city like here, right? Like, oh, because you guys, right? You guys were in a small town. Yeah, we're in a yeah. country, right? That's right. Right. I mean, like the the the, the local sheriff and the five cops yeah. that work there like know all the families yeah, and everything like that. So it's a little bit different, right? In a small town yeah, we were like that, throwing like water balloons. You know, that's as like hardcore as we were doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we did that too, though. We had a van and we would take uh, you know, the the water balloon launcher. Yeah. And so two guys would hold it on the end, and then we'd slide open the door. 
car yeah. and we drive by people and pelt them with oh the, my god yeah wow. pelt them with the this is all country stuff right what yeah. you do when you're out in the country of nothing Man, that's terrible yeah you get three channels on tv out there and oh, yeah, you, you gotta make your own fun <laughs> that's that's <laughs> terrible yeah it, kids now just like to play video games i yeah. think i'm okay with that now <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, no, i'm no, serious making the case for it dude yeah. when i think back you know this i mean we used to do stupid shit all the time too and i think back and you forget right but you start telling stories like this yeah and and now as an adult because you know let's be honest when you're a teenager especially a teenage boy your brain's not fully not fully operating properly you're not you're no. just making stupid decisions all the time so as an adult now if i think back now that i have a teenage boy as a son i think what if he did that and it's oh totally different I know. It changes the, the whole... You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like, imagine if your son now was a teenager and he came home and you found out he was knocking on people's doors and hitting them with... Well, this... You know, you, know you don't watch Billions, but I know you two... Doug, you guys are... You're on the... You guys are oh, current, yeah, current on current. Billions, right? And... So, one of the last episodes... Actually, I thought this was the one, Sal, you watched with us. Maybe you weren't paying attention. Did not. But the, the, the his son goes to a, you know, a really... You know, prestigious, you know, private school, mm -hmm. and he gets he gets in trouble because he's in the basement of the school and he's mining Bitcoin. Uh, but like, I mean, it the the idea of what he's doing is is brilliant, but it's still theft. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And he's and and his dad comes in <clears throat> and he gets into it with like the headmaster who wants to expel him from the school, and and you know he's he's thinking Axel, the main character, he's thinking, oh my god, this is going to ruin my kid's future potential, this or that. Mm. And, no way he's going to allow this. So he decides to blackmail the headmaster to keep his his kid in there. And Katrina was asking me, like, do you think because, yeah, I mean, I totally, there's a lot of, of Axel that I, I identify with, right, and I can relate to. And she's like, you wouldn't do that, would you? And I'm like, hell no. I was like, I, I, I would make my kid pay for the consequences. That, that's just them building the character and showing that he's flawed and that he has insecurities himself. That yeah. I, think, I think that's a terrible lesson if your kid does something like that and you don't. You know, you, you don't, don't let them, yeah, pay for what they've, uh, yeah. yeah, done. Well, themselves. one thing that they talk about in that love and logic course I was telling you guys I was taking, one thing that they say I think is really smart is they said, let your kids face the consequences of their actions now because the consequences are far smaller and not as permanent as when they become older. So right. it's like, oh, they, they forgot to study for their test. They get an F on a test. That's not as big of a deal as them losing their job. Mm -hmm. You know, later on, whether right, older right. or you know, doing something much you know more terrible, or, or making the a smart paying the consequences for not being making smart decisions when they're seven versus getting into the car with their friend who's a drunk driver, you know, when they're driving type of stuff. I think that makes perfect sense. It's hard as a parent though, right? Because you don't want your kids to feel any pain or, or have to deal with any consequences because it still sucks. Yeah, you know, you still see that. Well, sucks. yeah, your your instinct is to want to you know get involved, but yeah, to to be able to refrain from that so they learn that lesson is is so much of a better strategy. Yeah. I think the, I think the hard ones have got to be when it, it pokes at your own insecurities, right? Of like, course. Like I mean, I've, that's I, always what it is. I'd imagine that would be probably the you guys have maybe experienced this because you guys have kids that are older. Like, well, dude, think about this. Like, I don't know. Um, you know, imagine if your kid was going to present in front of a group and you're insecure about doing the same type of thing mm -hmm. and then they f they freak out or they're whatever or they force them to do right something or, or maybe you're insecure about sports or you know something like that and you see your kid playing and they're not good and you want to tell them no you don't got to do that don't worry about it because it's your own right you know so th that's almost always you know what it is I, that thing i'm doing with my with my son where you know if he forgets a chore i don't say anything to him oh, he right. just sees it in his because we share notes on the phone he just yeah. sees on his notes that he owes me five dollars <laughs> to have to do it for him so, and that's actually kind of hard to do because I want to almost remind them, hey, don't forget to do that. Yeah. But the idea is you don't remind them. Uh -huh. You allow them to do whatever and fa and it cracks me up because I'll just, you know, I'll take out the recycling or whatever and then I'll put it in the notes, you know, $5, you know, he owe me $5 and then you'll show up on his phone and then you'll, you'll hear him, wait a minute, I, oh. Okay. <laughs> so you've been you've been doing this now no for argument. a little while now. Yep. What are you seeing, like uh, behavioral wise, from him? Like, it's what been you know? it's been effective. So the the one of the challenges with having a dual, you know, raising my kids in two households is that they're you know one week at my house, one week at their mom's house. So that means if I in, if I do something new, they only get to do it with me for a week. Then they go to the mom's house. She may have a totally different situation. Then they come back and it's almost like it takes longer. It takes longer because I can't be consistent mm -hmm. every single day. Because although we raise the kids 
and we agree on things similarly, there's still some 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 differences, right? Like right. she doesn't do that with him, yeah. right? Do you she tell just, your ex like what you're up to? With him? I did, but she's not gonna, and yeah. I don't I don't expect her to. That's well, fine. yeah, I mean just just yeah. so she knows. So what ends up happening is he comes back to my house, and he typically will forget a couple times, but then he gets back on it. But now this is the third week. Really, it's been six weeks, right? Because it's back and forth. But it's right. the third week with me. And I'm not telling him what to do, and he's remembering to do it on his own much more often. So the last couple times out of the whole week, he only forgot twice. So he had he owed me ten bucks. It's five dollars each time. Yeah. So this time he's so far forgot once. So we'll see. We'll see how it works. But so far it seems to be working. Now, how is he getting money in order to fund it? Does he have a sal or does he have a salary? Does he have an, uh, a, a uh, allowance that you pay him? Well, or? no. He they get money for, for for birthdays and gifts and stuff that they set, that they save. Yeah. So he's got money. So I don't know what will happen when he runs out. That's, yeah. that's yeah. something I haven't figured out yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know? What are we going to do to give hey, him a bill when he graduates? Hey, yeah, yeah. Speaking of money, what do you guys think about what Facebook's doing? Have you guys seen that they're going to be adjusting salaries based? off of where people live so there's and pay more if you live in an expensive area pay less you, well it's there there's no more paying more everyone's already at the cap of what they've been paying it's going to be a straight cut for anybody oh, that they're cutting and that so you mentioned an article earlier about how there's this you know theory that we're going to see a lot of people like moving out of the silicon valley that are going to be working from home now mm -hmm. and maybe moving to the valley into smaller towns and so Facebook is going to be adjusting salaries of based off of where they go and they live. Of Even though the job uh, is the same, same experience, same everything, but are now going to start adjusting incomes based on where they yeah, live. I wonder how many people had plans like, oh man, I'm going to take advantage of this and live somewhere where it's cheaper, totally. but I'm going to get the same revenue coming I in. I mean, wouldn't you? I, yeah. would, I, would, I mean, I would right that, away if I, sucks for them. if I work for Twitter and Facebook and I now have this option to work from home. Well, so it's it's good for both parties because the, the Facebook now saves money on you know how having to have these big offices. People work remotely. So that's good for, for Facebook. It's good for the employee. I get to work from home. It's good for my commute. Facebook's going to yeah. now pay them less. As a result, I bet a lot of these people don't mind the trade. They might think to themselves, that's okay. I'll get paid less, but now I get to work from home. I don't have to go into an office. Mm -hmm. But this makes perfect sense. That's actually the statistics actually show that. There wasn't that as much as you would have thought there would have been a revolt. Uh, there was a, a decent amount of people or a decent percentage of people that were okay. I a hundred. I bet you, if uh, if companies mm. told their employees, "We'll pay you this much if you come into the office every day," <clears> or you'll make this much, you'll make less, but you get to work from home every day. I bet you yeah, a majority people of people, yeah. a majority of people. Would, well, would especially if you home. know that you could just move thirty minutes to an hour away, like in our in where we live, right, Silicon Valley. You could literally just drive, you know, forty five minutes almost any direction and save two, three hundred thousand yeah. dollars on a mortgage. Yep, yeah. Yep. That's a big difference. Yep. You know, it's that's huge. Yeah. You're talking about a few hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a month uh, that you could be saving just by living outside. Now of I'd the like town. to see the hmm. how they figure this out. Is it is it region? Is so it that, small locality? So that's what the article was all about, was the difficulty of figuring it out. Yeah, because it can't be city to city. Like, okay, San Francisco is more expensive than San Jose. So what, if you live in San Jose, now you get paid less? I would imagine it's probably bigger than that, right? Like, yeah. if you live as far south as Morgan Hill or as far north <laughs> as whatever, you get paid this. So what's going to happen is you're going to see cities like Morgan Hill, San Jose, Gilroy, probably go up in value because all those people who are yeah i was gonna think maybe those go up in value w would you think the properties like closer uh you know in the city would go down a bit like no. maybe of, like the convenience used to be the biggest thing right yeah, well maybe. the only thing about that is that we there's just still not enough inventory there's That's not, yeah, there's so not inventory. if it would be different like the thing when you go south enough like for us and i know that for listeners that don't have any idea about california this conversation <laughs> sucks but just, I mean, the, the towns that we're mentioning are, they're not rural, but they're, you know, 30 minutes away from the city and there's land, right? So there's places still to build and construction still to happen in the heart of San Jose. You, there's no building. No. There's yeah. no property to build on. You're, you're remodeling houses, but there's no new property. So there's not room for it to really right. grow. And there's still more people, enough people wanting or wanting to come in that I don't think it's going to reduce uh, prices here at all. I think it, your theory is right. You'll just see those surrounding cities. This is a good. Believe it or not, this is going to be a good thing for the for uh, c consumers and for for people who are looking to get work. It's going to get more competitive. Now you're not going to have to move to a place just to get a good tech job. Mm -hmm. They're going to seek out further. If you live in areas that typically didn't have lots of tech jobs, and you thought, oh, I have to move to you know Boston or 
you know, San Jose or San Francisco or Austin to get a tech job, you're probably you're probably going to see more opportunities. This is mm. actually a very good thing. Speaking of another really good thing, and I'm super excited about this and can't wait. Maybe Doug can look up when it rolls out because I don't remember what I read. Uh, but IGTV is now so Instagram <clears throat> their their video right their IGTV is now going to start showing ads. And they're still going to start paying much like YouTube does, where it'd be a rev split. So right now, like our YouTube channel, when you see the commercial, the minute long commercial or whatever that you can skip after 15 seconds of it, um, you know, we make a little bit of money for that. And then obviously YouTube makes a, a, a more of that money for being able to advertise on all these platforms. They are uh, Instagram is moving to the same model. So that's really exciting for the content creators that have been on Instagram or have large Instagram followings or like in our case, like our, I, I would say the most activity that we have, even though our YouTube channel is bigger per se, because we have, you know, I think we're approaching, I think we're about to roll over 400,000 subscribers. Instagram just a lot more interactive. Way more interaction. Yeah. And, you know, the algorithm, the way they pay you is, you know, on that. It is, it's not just views. It's also view time and how much engagement is going on for, for videos. And my theory is that even though we've put a lot of time, money, and effort uh, into building a YouTube, I think that the IG, IGTV stories will do better for us uh, and our business. Interesting. And, now, yeah. I wonder how they're going to pay. Is it going to be like YouTube where it's like how time watched? Totally. Or? It'll be an algorithm like that. I don't know exactly what the algorithm- See, that to me always was so stupid because you guys know as well as I do that you're, how well you convert into sales- Yes, views play a role, but really it's about how valuable your channel is and the kind of people. Well, you're the tracking. algorithm is factoring that in, right? So it does. Yeah, yeah. So like you know, you get uh, you know, and I, I mind you, this is my my understanding of it. You know, I'm not an expert in how YouTube pays people, but from what I understand and what I've read. You know, you get more money if people stay longer, which means the content that you're presenting is more valuable than someone who they dip out in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So you get more money there. If people are commenting and asking more questions or interacting with the video, it's going to get you paid more. Uh -huh. So, you know, view time, interaction with it, you know, even though it's not a direct correlation with are you good at selling or not mm -hmm. selling something, it is it is pointing in the direction that you're probably providing better content than maybe a competitor right. because people are listening, this watching, is and talking. Th this is really cool. We're, we're, we are literally li living through the the beginnings of new media really taking over. Oh, there's and a watching massive it, shift going on. Watching yeah. it just develop and turn into, you know, the, the, the monsters. that I mean, people think they're monsters now. You just wait in ten years. Oh man, it's yeah. that Rogan deal. Like I'm still Dude, tripping out on that. A majority of people still in America to this day get their news from the mainstream broadcast news. Yeah, Pe more people still watch broadcast TV than do new media. Radio still has more people than podcasts, but you know that's going to change. Yeah, it's it's moving the swinging so fast in the opposite direction. We're looking at five It'll years. Be the new standard, real soon, and it's going to be very developed. Yeah. And all the big big marketers and big you know brands are going to be on new media, and we're kind of living through this. Oh, it's it's a, it's a very interesting time right now to be in this space because you're watching too <clears throat> all of them, Facebook and Instagram and and YouTube and Net, they're all creating their own content that's competitive. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, this IGT. TV thing and that's a direct, that's in direct competition of YouTube. Yeah. You know, I mean, look at it from our perspective, right? No idea. This wasn't even on our radar. I wasn't even thinking about this. Now, all of a sudden, if our IGTV starts to perform better revenue wise, there'll be very little effort put into continuing to scale the YouTube side mm -hmm. of the business and all of it will be put into Instagram. Totally. Oh, yeah. So it becomes very, now, and look at what happened with Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan signs this deal. Now is also going to, and by the end of this year, pull off all of his stuff from YouTube yep. and it'll be private to Spotify. Oh, it's a war. I yeah. Know, it is. No, we're going to see. And, and for the, because uh, Instagram's owned by Facebook. <clears throat> YouTube is owned by Google. Google. Yep. Oh boy. Oh yeah. So it's the it's information wars. Indeed. I it's, love it. It's beginning, and and if you're a content creator, it's a really good time to be in here, especially if as you're refining your craft and getting be better at building your network. You know, eventually these platforms, which we're all offering services for free, you you if you've done a really good job of building a, a, an audience are going to be fighting for your attention totally. or your time and for you to use their platform. So we're going to start seeing contracts. I think it's going to look a lot like athletes. It's going to be really interesting. I think you're going to start seeing more and more of these content creators 
get signed for deals that say, hey, you only are on YouTube. Hey, mm -hmm. you're only on Instagram. Of course. Bro. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Interesting. So speaking of really smart things, <laughs> I thought this was a very smart move uh, by a company that I don't always <clears throat> usually agree with. So PETA uh, has purchased shares in some of the major U.S. and Canadian slaughter companies, including Tyson, Hormel, and Smithfield. So they bought a bunch of shares in these companies what? so that they can take on the role of an activist shareholder. Wow. So owning stock in the companies gives PETA the ability to attend annual meetings, correspond with other shareholders according to the SEC rules, and urge directly urge CEOs to convert the slaughterhouses to eventually only produce plant-based proteins. So in other words, very smart move. Yeah. I think this is- Right to the lion's den. This is perfect. I, I, I love this. Not that I agree with them, but I like the way no, that that's, they're doing that's it. That's the way to protest. Is, that's right. To get involved and have a say yep. uh, yeah, internally. I think that's real smart. So they, they're, gonna, they're buying a bunch of shares so that they have a voice. And Now here's the thing. At the end of the day, uh, it's the consumers that decide. So if, yep. if Tyson- you know, let's say PETA owns a bunch of shares and they say, let's switch over to this. And they end up losing a bunch of money because consumers are like, I don't want to eat, yeah. you know, Franken food or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, yeah. then chicken you know, Ferky, then they're going to be totally screwed. You know what yeah. I mean? I thought it was funny. Did you guys see all the pictures that have been going on since the whole COVID thing? I know there's always like all the, the vegan foods that are all still there, but then all like the real meat Dude, has been gone. People need it's to pretty interesting that that's happening. Right? People need to understand something. Again, I'm not anti, I'm not a carnivore, yeah. you know, advocate. Uh, Just I think, watch Naked I th and Afraid. I think there's value exactly i think there's value in in plant foods as well but the, this is a fact this is a hundred percent fact the most nutrient dense foods on the planet and the most complete nutrient dense foods on the planet are animal they mm. just are you eat an egg you get all you get almost all your essential nutrients yeah. organ meats organ meats are so nutrient dense that you actually if you were to eat like a liver every day from an animal you would overdose yeah, yeah. They're the most nutrient Too dense. Much That's right. Some of the best supplements. In fact, uh, the company we work with, Paleo Valley, makes an organ complex. Essentially, oh, I know they started doing that. Yeah. So it's so an old school supplement that uh, one of the first supplements that bodybuilders really valued a lot back in the day was like desiccated liver tablets mm. and organ, you know, basically organ meat type supplements. And this is because they found that when, and I found this too. When they would eat more organ meats, they would notice improvements in strength and performance. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first supplements that they made for bodybuilders was exactly that. In fact, uh, Vince Garanda, who is known as being one of the first like bodybuilder scientists, like one of the smart guys or whatever, he advocated people take something like 30 to 40 desiccated liver tablets every single day yeah. when training hard to build muscle. I remember muscle. them really like promoting liver pills for, for quite a yes. long time. Yes. And so this, these organ, in fact, I have it here. Let me look at it real quick. This is, uh, yeah, it's Organ Complex from uh, Paleo Valley. So it's made with uh, liver, heart, and kidney. And so essentially it's capsules. The, here's, the, here's the drawback with uh, organ meats. A lot of people don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I appreciate this because in pill form, I'm way more likely to be consistent. Yeah. So I'll do chicken liver sometimes when I want the high cholesterol because you guys know how that, you know, make you stronger. Yeah. Um, but uh, more often than not, I take uh, tablets like this or capsules like this because, you know, find heart. First, you got to go find the heart or kidney at the grocery store. How do you prepare it? I wasn't raised eating all these organ meats. They taste kind of weird. Yeah. It's not the best. You know, my kids definitely won't eat it. Well, that's the reality of it. We talk always about this is the, the cultural thing. ideally yeah. getting it through Whole Foods, right? I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, but I mean, how many people on a regular basis? And I know there's a, a small percentage that do this, and that's awesome. I mean, the best thing is to go to your butcher mm -hmm. every single week and mm -hmm. go get get a, a you know all of these and prepare it weekly. But you know, your option to have, and I think it's a valuable option to have, and everybody's covered is to have like these pills to where it's like, okay, if I know I haven't had any of this in the last week or month. Like this is something I need to be supplementing in there for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. did you guys hear about Disney World um, announcing that they're going to be reopening? I saw that. Yeah, I don't July. know all the specifics to that, but that's uh, good for them. So Hopefully they, it works out. So this is in Florida. Obviously, California, Disney, Disneyland still, we don't know what's going on. But Disney World in Florida will be opening July 11th. Uh, there's new rules. Um, people are going to have to wear masks as they're walking through. I believe everybody's temperature is going to be taking, so let me see, it's temperature checks upon arrival. Uh -huh. um, everybody has to wear a face covering. 
The use of the park's existing digital magic wristbands will facil facilitate mobile food rather than face-to-face -face interactions, and that they're going to be using the uh, lots of plexiglass barriers. So this is the and, and then all the parades and stuff are out. So none of the parades, none of the fireworks, none of the character meet and greets. What about uh, like lines? Like how are they going to deal with that? Like I don't know. It didn't say so much. But I mean, well, if you have to wear a mask, then you're fine, then, right? Dude, yeah. But this just, is oh, this okay. is going to be, in my opinion, a buying opportunity for Disney stock. Because yeah. here's my prediction: I believe they're going to open July 11th, and people are going to hate it. They're not going to. I mean, imagine taking your kids yeah. and everybody. And it's by the way, it's Florida, July in July. Everybody has to wear masks. Everybody's gonna be. They're gonna be half on. You know, like Dude, they're, they're, like kids are just gonna throw them some places. Not only that, but you know, I was having this conversation uh, with uh, with Jessica. You know, in California, they're talking about these these reopening of school standards, and how they're probably gonna ask all the kids to wear masks. Yeah, and no recess, no like, dude, no fun. Yeah. it's just like, yeah, just go up to class. We got like plexiglass in between all the kids. Like, it's like, it, is dude, it really unreasonable? Like that? That's what they're super. That's, unreasonable. Those are guidelines. And I was talking to, you know, I was, I was thinking about this, and I'm like, you know, there wasn't, there was something that happened a year ago when my daughter was in school. You know, they have these new laws now where if like something happens in the neighborhood, they'll lock down the school and then they tell the kids to hide behind backpacks and do this whole thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And they don't, I don't think they calculate this, but that itself is traumatizing to the kid. Mm -hmm. So now, then my daughter, she freaked out about it for a while. She's like, we had to hide behind backpacks and we were just not talking and sitting. And I, I'm trying to put myself in the mind of a, th a third grader, you know? And I was like, oh man. So now I'm thinking they're going to go to school. Yeah. They're going to wear masks. They're going to be encouraged to stay away from each other. It's going to be a lot of anxiety and fear. So I was I was talking to Jessica and I'm like you know the our best uh, option is if this is what has to happen is that we just act like it's not a big deal because they're going to look at us as the parents on how we react so I think we just yeah. act like it's oh yeah just wear your mask no big deal yeah yeah, yeah it's no you know because people are going to free so now go to Disney World with your kids <laughs> they're like there to be excited but everybody's wearing masks it's super weird yeah I don't know if that's going to work well, I'll so definitely well. watch Disney because like in terms of all the the new landscape I feel like. They've always mastered like efficiency from like every end of whatever they do. That's so a good point. It'd be interesting to watch how they manage like real big groups of people. That's you, a very very. Do you guys point. see what Ford is doing? No. So okay, so Ford is what uh, is partnered with uh, the cops, right? So they do a lot of the cop cars. Mm. And one of the big concerns right now is having all these people in and out of the back seats of cop cars. Oh. So they are have created a new model that takes the back seat and turns it up to 132 degrees. And the idea is to <laughs> Cook off Roast any your ass. cook off any germs or anything. Well, that, when the person gets out, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I, I see the back. You just turn it on. Yeah, I would assume that's exactly what they Interrogation, do. Interrogation, right? Someone comes yeah. in and then they just crank it up, and it turns into like an oven oh, in the back. Interesting. Yeah, isn't that isn't that random? Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. That Have you guys seen those like self cleaning uh, bathrooms in? I think Japan has them, hmm. where after done using it, you push a button. And then, like, the, there's a covering on the toilet seat that rotates through, and it gets like cleaned. The whole thing gets sprayed. It's all self cleaning. Sick. Have you guys? They've been around for a while. No, right? I haven't oh, seen this. Yeah, That's they've been idea. around for a while. So the outside of it too, everything. Like, how does it? The in, so the the bathroom is enclosed. You know, think of a porta potty except a permanent, like nice okay, one. Okay. Okay. You go and use the bathroom. Then when you close the door. The whole thing disinfects. Oh, the whole thing. It's been around. Yeah, those have been around for a while. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, I wonder if those are going to be yeah, more. Let's get one in here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can't even shit in our bathroom. Can I just? Yeah, can I just complain? I, w I hope our landlord listens. Yeah. Our he, air, air conditioning does doesn't work. No. Toilets are broken constantly. What the hell's going on here? <clears throat> yeah, um, we're suffering. Yeah, there. what's going on, yeah. dude? Dude, I, I was listening to this podcast and uh, uh, more random facts that I just like. I pay attention to. I'm like, oh, whoa! I didn't know that. You guys might know this. You might not know this, but. Uh, I didn't know that uh, like Native Americans don't have the male pattern baldness gene. What? Yeah, they don't go bald. Yeah, apparently, if if, if you're like uh, full, yeah, full full Native American, like any any tribe here, like they were None? saying, yeah, the, wow. So it's just like you know, uh, over time, as like you know, white people came in, whatever, like you know, and, and mixed it in with that, like then you'd, you'd see uh, Native Americans with you know, bald heads, but like before that, it was just like no, no baldness. Well, there you go, Adam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. is Katrina having Native yeah. American? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah you miss, so. Maybe you'll throw. We in know some Adam doesn't yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. 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 throw some jeans in, in there. there. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our first question is from Will Schreiner. Is the ab wheel a gimmick or essential? 
Oh, Advil. Good old Advil. Well, that's a, that's an extreme right there. A gimmick or essential? Yeah. I don't know. Essential? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Not, not essential. I don't think any fitness tool is essential. So I love, I'm going to tell you why I love the ab wheel, and I'm going to tell you why I hate the ab wheel, okay? I love the ab wheel because in terms of being in a muscle building exercise for the abs, it's one of the best ones I've ever used. The resistance is heavy. You really have to know how to use your abs, uh, how to use your abs properly in order to make it work. But if you do, it works the abs in ways that other exercises just don't. It's very, it's a phenomenal exercise. I love it because it's ten dollars. Yeah, that's also very cheap. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like it's one of the better tools for abs, and it's what ten bucks on Amazon yep. to get one of those things. Yep. Now here's the problem: if you don't do it right, it's a wonderful way to hurt yourself. Hundred and, and yeah. I'm talking about here's all the places you can hurt yourself: your wrist, your shoulders, your low back. Yeah. You could pull a hip flexor actually quite common that people hurt themselves with an ab wheel. Most people don't know how to use one properly. The way you use an ab wheel properly is you crunch your abs before you roll out. Then as you roll out, you slowly uncrunch your abs, but don't overdo it and then suck back in by pulling with your abs. If you just use your arms or your hip flexors, your abs are maybe stabilizing, but you're going to ask. You're asking for uh, you know a lot of trouble. That's one of the number one viral videos that we did on YouTube. It was the first viral video we ever did on YouTube uh, that we did like three years ago, maybe four mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. So you know, and again, we've mentioned this a few times, but you know, remember anytime we talk about videos, especially if we've created the videos that. Jackie always links those in the show notes, so you can That's go. That's at to, Mind Pump Podcast, I believe. Yeah, mindpumppodcast.com. You can go there, and she links anytime we talk about this. So if you want to watch the video, but yeah, no, that's an incredible video uh, because I I remember even myself doing it wrong for such a long time. Yeah, and you know it makes a huge difference when you understand how to really rotate the pelvis before you go into into the ab and keep it and keep it controlled. And many people don't have the the strength and control to do a full range full range most so, people because you not yeah. only have to have a really really strong core you have to have strong arms and you have to have good stabilization in just the upper body in general because your arms are involved in the exercise now they're not they shouldn't be the prime movers if you do it right but if you're not able to stabilize yourself with your arms yeah. you're gonna roll out and flop and hit the floor so I, I actually haven't had very many in all my years of training I've only had a few clients I've ever even done this with mm-hmm all right, next question is from Jazz Fitness. How do you know if you're getting results because of what you're doing or in spite of what you're doing? Uh, you're going you're to mess with your Jazz head. Fitness knows how to scat. You yeah, know what I'm saying? That's a... <laughs> <Skibidoo -bop -bop. laughs> if you... The, okay, you got to be careful not to play mind games with yourself because if you get trapped in the cycle of, am I doing enough? Is this perfect? Um, that could really mess with you. So number one... Are you getting good results? Do you feel really good? Are you getting good sleep? Do you feel healthy? Are you getting stronger? All that stuff. If it's a yes, then I would say you're probably okay. You're probably doing an okay job. Here's where things get kind of weird. If you're doing all that, getting great results, I feel good, I'm strong, I'm getting good sleep, healthy, healthy libido, skin looks good, everything looks good. And then I sit there and I ask myself, could I be getting there faster? Hmm. Am I doing the the right things? Am I perfect? What ends up happening from that is you end up overdoing things. This is a game I used to get in with myself. If I saw some progress, then I would add more. If I had a great workout, wow, that was good. I got stronger. Next week, I'm going to do even more. And you get trapped in this, in this cycle of questioning yourself. So really, just you got to look at all those things. And if all those things are doing well, you're probably doing okay. Well, I, I have a kind of a key indicator for you that you're not. most people are going to like to hear, but it's true, is if you're getting really fast results, <clears throat> they're probably not good mm. because the body does not build muscle and burn body fat very fast. It's not a fast process. It's a very slow process. That's a good point. So if you know your goal, let, in, take either end of the spectrum. If your goal is to lose body fat, you know you have a 30, 50 pound goal to lose weight, and you know you're losing five pounds a week, you know or more. Uh, not good. You know, even if that's your goal, it's still, that's not, that's too fast. Your body is most certainly not just losing body fat at that rate. So if you're, and then the same thing is true. If your goal is to build, you want to build muscle, you want to add 20 pounds or 10 pounds of muscle to your body and you're gaining two pounds a week. You're not gaining two pounds of muscle a week. It's just that this, the body doesn't do it that fast. Not unless you're on anabolic steroids. So if yeah. you're an all natural person, even then, yeah, you're not yeah, gaining right, two right, pounds right. a week. Exactly. That's my point. Is so honestly, <clears throat> a, a, a really good indicator that you might be, you know, seeing results in spite of what you're doing or doing it right is if it's really fast. Mm -hmm. This is a very slow process, 
And if you're seeing major fluctuations on the scale week over week, it's too quick, regardless of what direction you're trying to go. Uh, and that's, that's a very, very good point. Um, I, I would see this with weight loss a lot with clients. You know, oh my God, I'm doing everything right. I lost, you know, 12 pounds this month. And I said, whoa, you know, hold on a second. Right. Let's do the body fat test and see what's happening. He's like, oh, we lost some muscle. Looks like we also lost a lot of water. Um, you know, I would look at their program. It usually consisted of a lot of cardio and a dramatic, you know, reduction in calories. Here's another thing. Um, is what you're doing uh, something you can maintain? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say you are getting good results or you think you're getting good results and you think you feel good and all this other stuff. But then you look at your routine, your diet, and you're like, and you got to be honest with yourself. Could I do this forever? Right. If the answer is no, then you're probably either A, come up with a good exit strategy so that you don't get this crazy rebound, or B, you know, change your routine. Maybe you are doing, you know, too much. Maybe it's something that's not going to benefit you in the long term. But again, you know, I, I do stress this don't get stuck in the mental game of, am I doing enough? I know I feel good, but maybe I could do more because that cycle, uh, boy, can that spin in your head? Yeah, I keep waiting to get like a specific metric for this. Like I know HRV has been trying to tackle, mm. uh, you know, based on how you feel, like how to interpret that on, you know, the variability of your heart rate uh, in the morning. And also like we've talked about just testing out like your your force output and your grip and like how strong your grip was which i thought is smart like so if there's a way that you can measure i think strength is just a good measure in general uh to see uh whether or not uh you know you're progressing or you should back off a little bit uh and just keep that always in mind everything else aesthetic wise and uh you know weight loss or you know muscle gain it's all going to revolve around like maintaining yeah, that strength and pay attention to a lot of signs not just your your workouts or your weight loss or weight gain, like, you know, are you sleeping good? How is your energy? Do you have good mood? Does your skin look good? Do you have any signs of poor health? Um, you know, you could be progressing in the gym, but be but you could be having bad skin or start to notice you're irritable or, you know, you'll see bodybuilders do this when they get really, really, really lean. At some point, they start to lose their sex drive. They start to become irritable, yet they're becoming more shredded. Is that something that would be, would you consider that, you know, going in the right direction? And uh, definitely when you throw in the, is it sustainable question, the answer is almost always no. So those are the things you want to kind of ask yourself. But then at the end of the day, if everything feels good, um, just relax, relax in it. You're probably okay. Next question is from Minnie Fig. I know Sal has talked about being an intuitive eater. How do you go about staying in shape, cutting or bulking without counting calories? Okay, so if so, first off, this is a, a long process. It's a process of, of really, because here's the thing. We all, most of us, have assigned really one value to food, which is how enjoyable is it to eat that food, just from a, from a hedonistic uh, viewpoint. So if you and your friends, for example, are discussing where to eat, Usually, you're, the thing you're considering is which one is going to sound the best right. and the most fun. You know, oh, let's go Mexican. No, I don't feel like that. How about Chinese? Oh, I don't know. Maybe Italian. Yeah, let's all get. And that tends to be the the conversation. And it's it's a result of us living in a, a wealthy society with lots of food and a market that responds to consumers and gives us what we think we want all the time. And so, almost all of our value is placed on <clears throat> just how good the food tastes and how enjoyable it is. Again, from the hedonistic. Viewpoint. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is when it's just that, when that's all I value. So if that's how I am after, you know, being on this planet for, you know, a couple of decades or whatever, I can't possibly intuitive eat because all the value that I place on food is that. So if I intuitively eat from that standpoint, then I'm going to choose <laughs> what sounds good. Always. What sounds good all the time. Mm, yeah. there's, there's no intuition there. My intuition is off. So what you have to start to do is you really have to start to understand all of the values of food in the truest sense, how they affect your digestion, how they affect your sleep, how they affect your performance, how they make your skin look. Like really look at all, you know, how they make your moods feel. After I eat this, I feel energized. After I eat this, I feel tired. Start to pay attention to all of this stuff and become aware of it. What'll end up happening over time is you'll start to find yourself valuing foods for other things aside from just the flavor or the palatability. And you'll enjoy eating them just the same. So like when, when I go on trips with, you know, sometimes, you know, Adam, Justin, myself, and Doug will go on these trips 
And because we're on trips and we're working a lot, our diets aren't the best. We eat out quite a bit. In fact, every meal we'll be eating out. When I'm coming home after five days of this, I'm literally craving vegetables. Now, I, I, don't, I would not put broccoli or spinach you know, at the top of my foods I enjoy eating because of the taste list. It's not even in the top 20, right? But I enjoy eating them nonetheless because I've now connected the value of those foods. And how it makes you feel. And how it makes me feel. So I want it. I actually genuinely want it. So that's the process of getting to the point where you can eat intuitively. Now, when you want to eat more, you can eat more to bulk and you can make food choices based off of all this new information and connections that you've made. So sometimes I eat foods that are very palatable and delicious. Delicious. Other times I may eat something because I notice I feel a particular way or I notice that my body needs something else. But this is a process. It's a process of unlearning what you've learned mm. for most of the time you've been alive. And then it's a process of learning new stuff about food. It's knowledge and uh, you know applied application. It's, it's both of those things. It's a long period to get to that point. It's the black belt level, right? Yeah. After you've gone through the tracking process, after you've gone through you know which foods specifically work best for you, because there's so many foods that are so generally uh, recommended for everybody that may not even be benefiting you, but you haven't done the work to really tease that out. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a matter of getting to that, that point where you can free yourself from having to have so much structure because it's already subconscious. It's already in, uh, you know, a level where, you know, you know how to navigate, uh, based off of whatever environment you're in. Well, I remember when we, we first started talking about this, I, I, struggled with us discussing this before we had the intuitive guide, right? This was before we wrote the intuitive guide. We were obviously already talking about intuitive eating. And I think I struggled the most discussing it because I just, I felt that a majority of the people that I trained in my career just weren't ready for this step yet. Most people are still learning. And I think of it just like learning math or learning a language. Like there are certain steps that you have to do to understand how to speak that language or figure out how to do, you know, whatever math equation. But after you've practiced that enough times, you can begin to start to do that in your head, right? You don't have to sit down and write out the, the entire equation anymore because you've practiced it so much. You don't have to sound out words anymore. You just speak it because you've probably, but it's, to me, it is, it's that nuanced that you have to kind of gone through the tracking process and learning about macronutrients and calories and a difference of a high activity day, a low activity day for you, how your body responds. Once you've kind of started to piece all that together, yeah, then it, be, then it becomes very easy to be uh, intuitive eating. Just like we think that the ultimate pinnacle of training is uh, intuitive training. You know, the the idea of like going through all the MAPS programs isn't that we force you to do MAPS programs for the rest of your life. It's that once you've gone through kind of all of them, you really understand the fundamentals of training. You've learned what your body responds best to, what programs it did better than other programs on, and then you learn to kind of build that for yourself and adjust it to your day-to-day -day life. So, you know, before we had released the guide and we would talk about it, I did. I had a hard time communicating that on the podcast because I felt most people really aren't here yet, but there are. There's definitely steps that you want to take in the direction of of working towards that. That should be the ultimate goal is I want to get to that place. It is. And it's a process. It's, and I think it's always a process because constant, you know, you know, your life's context changes always. You get older, your body changes, your, how you respond to your emotions start to change. And so intuitive eating is just, it's always a process of kind of listening to your body. It's a, it's a process of awareness and food is just it's one of those challenges that we have in modern times. I mean, if this was 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, this would not be a challenge. You know, we would, food is healthy. And in order to get some of it, I have to move a lot and we don't have a lot of it. And so my problem is, you know, I got to get more food. I need, just need to get more food. That was the big problem. Now we have so much of it around us and in front of us all the time that the challenge now is how do I manage that? How do I manage around all this food? How do I manage myself around? Here's something you should do, step one, if you want to learn how to intuitive eat. It, try to eliminate foods that make it almost impossible to do this. Try to eliminate heavily processed foods. Heavily processed foods are engineered to make you want to eat more. So until you become so aware of the fact that, that of what that feels like, I'd say eliminate those for a little while because those foods make it almost impossible. They're designed to make it almost impossible. And let me tell you something, they win. You will not win 
unless you get to a very high level of how you feel and understand. Here's another one, how you react, how you eat based on your emotions. I mean, how, how aware are people about that when they get stressed or angry or happy, mm -hmm. how they tend to eat? So this is all part of the pro – look, it's like when you were a kid and you learned how to read. You know, Now, as an adult, if I see a word, I immediately know what that word says. But when I was a kid, I had to – Sound it out, you know. The, I had to sound out every letter. Or is before that I could, a metaphor? You know, exactly. Yeah. Or is it what they're actually saying? Exactly. Next question is from Will B. Will. Would you alter your advice for aspiring trainers to start their career in a big box gym due to industry changes caused by the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. What a what a weird time to get into the <sighs> I know the fitness space um, because of what's going on. I, okay, so when things kind of get and I, I do believe at some point we're going to see things look more like they used to I still think going to a big box gym is the way to start as a trainer you're going to have the most opportunities to work with the most amount of people to make the to learn the most to become the best communicator uh, to be able to train the most amount of people or whatever big box gyms are the place to do it they provide you with so many tools with the equipment, they provide you with all the marketing. And the most practice you're going to get It's the there. most practice. Mm -hmm. It's the best place to go. Right now, boy, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. Um, things are, are kind of weird and up in the air. I would say, you know, and I think this is probably something you're going to have to do anyway in the future, is to learn how to build some kind of a virtual uh, component to your business, either to complement personal training hmm. or that becomes – the business, your business itself, but um, but yeah, it's a bit of a weird time. I don't even know if gyms are even hiring at the moment. You know? I don't know because uh, I mean, my thoughts initially because I would always refer people to a big box gym because, like you guys said, I mean, it's the most uh, volume you're going to experience, and you could also watch other trainers and how they deal with. Uh, all of their clients and and what they're doing, uh, which is invaluable. So on on that lines, like I, I had also been a big proponent of of finding somebody you really respect uh, that you know has a gym that's still uh, you know around and thriving and and has more of a niche uh, focus to it and become uh, an, an apprenticeship. Figure out something where you could. Or, or just shadow them and and uh, you know you know offer to uh, sort of be an apprentice uh, and and learn as much as you can just kind of shadowing what they do. But I don't really know. Like again, the landscape has totally changed. So I'm I'm, I'm assuming that some of the more specialized gyms are probably going to be yeah. you know s survive more so. But uh, I still think that the 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 big box gym is the is the place for someone to start, even if uh, you know. 50% of them close down and rates go up and traffic is down significantly. It still, it still will be the, the best place to get the most practice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also one of the best places to be for an aspiring business, uh, you know, builder. I mean, if you're going to go, I mean, much of my business education came from working for a, a, you know, billion dollar company, uh, and observing, you know, observing the systems that they had in place and how they navigated tough times like this. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, if any, I don't think that Mark Mastroff is going to go broke from this situation by any means, regardless of how bad he gets hit or has to close down facilities, he will figure it out, right? And if you have an opportunity to work for a leader like that and work in their one of their facilities, a great opportunity to learn, you know, on many levels, aside from just the amount of repetitions that you're going to get because of the, the volume of traffic, but also just watching somebody at that level that has had success operate their business. So I still would steer somebody in that direction. Now, the only way I would I would go kind of like towards what Justin was alluding to, or I, I do see a lot of value in that. You know, if I if I'm somebody who has another career and I, I make an income already and I don't need to generate revenue right away, and it's just not a bad idea to go intern for somebody or work for free for a, a great fitness leader that you have an opportunity to be around. I mean, uh, Enzo was someone who took advantage of us like that, right? He saw an opportunity to come in, provide a service. I don't mean take advantage like in a bad way. I mean like he took advantage of a great opportunity, right? He saw that you know these guys I look up to in fitness I'm curious about this space I'm going to come offer my services for free to to pick their brand and that's exactly what he did he came in and 
learned a ton, and I think there's a lot of value. And the kid wasn't in need of money, so it wasn't like a negotiation mm -hmm. of, I need to make X amount of dollars. He was purely here to get the experience. And if you're in a situation like that, I think there's a tremendous amount of value to go offer your services for free to shadow people that you think are very talented in that space. Now, if you have to make a career change where you're like, I do this job, I make this much money, and now I'm going to go all in and, and, and try and make money in fitness, that way might be really tough because working in a private box to scale your business up, that would be really, really tough for a lot of trainers to I, do. Yeah, I just definitely don't think it's a good idea to go right to virtual. I just I don't think that um, there's any sort of authority you're going to be able to generate without doing it in person and, you know, like really spending time working on all the little nuances, like person to person first, because if you don't understand that, yeah. how are you ever going to be able to coach that uh, where you don't see all the angles? Yeah. The, be the, the best online coaches are ones that have worked with people in well, person for a long I, time. I really like what our, uh, Good friend, mind pump listener, longtime mind pump listener, one of our OGs, uh, Jonathan Alva. We've watched him do. Oh yeah, right. He is a he worked for Twenty Four, and I think he still is. It still works for one of them. But no, no, take that back. I know he's pivoted into his own business now. But this, I mean, he's been listening to mind pump for five years, and he's slowly integrated Instagram and YouTube videos, and he's been working he's got all a that podcast now. Yeah, and a podcast. But he's been doing it while he was also working for a big box gym. Then right. he had established himself enough to then go private and do his own thing, all while dabbling in that Instagram. Obviously, I know doesn't generate a ton of revenue or any potential revenue probably for him right now. But he's acquiring real estate in the virtual world while also working in the real, you know, hands-on world mm -hmm. and starting to kind of scale in that direction. I really like that strategy. I like the idea of go get real hands-on experience in a, in a place you're going to get a lot of practice. Meanwhile, you're getting your hands in, you know, the you know, Instagram, the Facebook, the mm -hmm. YouTube, the podcasting, learning all those platforms, seeing where your voice is best heard. You know, maybe you're terrible on camera and podcast, but then you're a great blogger. You write really well. So I would be dabbling in all of those mm -hmm. uh, pieces of content, those different mediums, while also getting the the real life practice on, on people that way, because I, I think you're silly if you if you completely ignore virtual and you go all in on brick and mortar. It, it just it's a very weird time right now to be betting that you know fitness is not going to dramatically change or shift, you know, in the direction of this virtual. I think and I think Peloton and Mirrors and Tonals are all example. I think Mind Pump is an example of the the future of what like fitness is starting to look like, and it's it's definitely moving in this direction of digital streaming media. And so even though the, you need that hands-on practice like Justin's talking about, I think also making sure that you're starting to acquire real estate on those other mediums too. Excellent. By the way, listeners, you may not know, you may not know this, but Mind Pump is also on YouTube. This podcast is actually filmed and put on YouTube. And one thing that we do is we separate the questions. So if you just want to see the answers to these fitness questions, you can do that on our YouTube channel, Mind Pump. Uh, podcast. You can also listen to the whole thing if you want to. So make sure you tune in. You can also find us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and the producer Doug at Mind Pump Doug.